Hi, welcome to Biofields Algae by Oberlin College's Plant Physiology class, Bio 334. So, you probably know that most of our energy comes from hydrocarbons, or oils and, and natural gases and things like this. And basically, we, we, we drill pretty deep trying to find a place called the, the oil window, which is about 2 to 4 kilometers deep and 60 to 100 degrees Celsius to, to get this stuff. Um, or we try to find a place where there's, there's an oil reserve. And we use, this, uh, we use this stuff for everything. We put it in our factories for all of our electricity. And the more we burn it, the more we release carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, increasing and adding to global warming. So uh, in order to, to make a move to more climate positive or neutral energy, um, energy we started growing corn and soy and turning it into a second generation biofuel, basically just ethanol, um, which we make through a fermentation process. And and there's a couple of problems associated with this, and you might you might be able to guess what they are. You might say, well, hey, corn and soybean are both really delicious, and if we're using all of them for biofuel production or a bunch of them, that means we're going to end up with a lot less of it for eating. And if you're especially clever, you might even say, well, if there's less corn and soy in the, in the food market, that means the price of the whole thing is going to go up, and it's going to be harder for everyone. Um, so some people say, well, maybe we can grow switchgrass, you know. Switchgrass is a perennial grass. It's, it's really great. Um, they, uh, you're not going to have to replant it year after year, even though you're harvesting it each year. Um, and that means, like, a lot less cost in terms of sort of just kind of the, the whole agricultural production. Um, and switchgrass has this great root architecture system, and that means that as this, the, the plant is sequestering carbon from the atmosphere in order to grow, or it's going to keep more of it in the ground where it's, it's going to be, be there for a, a long time, hopefully. But the problem is that switchgrass still needs pretty good land in order to grow. Uh, it's going to be taking up a lot of arable space, and that still makes us run into the same kind of problem with, with before. So what can we grow that it doesn't take up a lot of arable land, but it's still high in energy? And it turns out that algae might be the solution. What is this stuff anyway? I mean, this algae is so diverse. So there's, there's these microalgae that are really tiny, but grow really fast. They, they're everywhere. And then there's this kelp, which is like huge. They're humongous. You can find kelps that are 65 meters tall. Uh, or if you like to think of it this way, 42 and a half Angus cows stacked right on top of each other. But we really want to look into this, this microalgae stuff. And they can do a lot of things. And for one thing, they do grow really quickly. They can double their biomass in just a couple of days, which is one of the reasons why people say it's the only source of renewable biodiesel that can meet global demand for transportation. You know, people like J. Emmett Duffy and, and their lab. But other than that, like, what's so special about this stuff? I mean, like, like, what's all the hype? These scientists are raving about bio, about biodiesel from algae, like it's some kind of savior. Like, this is this is the the crap that sort of grows on. On, on ponds and it, it, it find ridiculous clumps of this stuff like floating around in industrial waste pools like it's, it's gross but it turns out that al that's one of the strengths of algae one of the best things about it is that it can grow in so many different places and there's so many different types of it you can find it in the, in the arctic growing you can find it at the beach sort of growing in salt water or you can find it in eutrophied water so like or polluted degraded water like anywhere you find water the algae is going to grow the stuff is everywhere uh, so some people said like, well, maybe we can start pumping some of the, some of this sort of gross water directly into the places where we're growing our algae. Um, that means that like we can sort of uh, use our our polluted industrial waste or our untreated sewage water for sort of kind of a good purpose and with, without just sort of dumping out into the environment to um sort of cause ecological degradation or or harm. Um, and it's good for the algae too because that means that they're getting all the nutrients they need to grow from, from this wastewater. And some people even said, well, like, we can also just you know, put directly pipe in carbon dioxide from, from, from burning different fossil fuels or burning different things back into the algae so that they can use this carbon dioxide for growing. And all of that is good. And what's even better is that as, as the water comes out after the algae is done, Know, doing its thing with it, uh, it comes a lot cleaner because the algae are going to eat a lot of the pollutants in the water. Things like nitrogen and phosphorus, which are really essential for for essential uh, minerals and, and nutrients that it needs to grow. And algae is going to remove 
so a sizable chunk of this stuff, like 20% of total nitrogen and 50% of total phosphorus. And people found that even some strains of algae can detoxify arsenic. These researchers over at Yellowstone National Park. So the main thing that we're looking to get from algae is probably going to be biodiesel. And biodiesels are all made from triglycerides. These are basically just like a, a, a fat molecule or an oil molecule with then so glycerol group and then three fatty acid chains. And plants make this pretty much just in a, your normal plant cell, you where you have the vacuole and then you like a nucleus and then a bunch of different organelles like the chloroplast and of course your mitochondria and prosthesomes around those. And in an endoplasmic reticulum, which is normally found out found sort of by the nucleus, is going to be squeezing off these little vesicles. And sometimes these vesicles are, are made of, are filled with proteins or other material, but sometimes they're also going to be filled with triglycerides, and then they're called oil bodies or oleosomes. A lot of plants make these. Soybean makes them, which is why we can make biodiesel out of soybean. But algae also happens to make make these oil bodies, which is uh, which is great because now we can we can sort of get this really energy rich molecule from algae. But we can't use it just yet. We can't just use triglycerides. They're kind of, of, of too large and, and viscous for us to put in our engines. So we have to break them down using a process called transesterification, basically using a uh, alkaline catalyst and an alcohol to turn it into sort of a glyceride and then three methyl esters, which is what we're going to turn into our biodiesel. We're going to burn that for energy. And then kind of as an as an added bonus, like so, we get all these free lunches with algae. Algae also happens to make free hydrogen, some strains of it, and then we can even feed the leftover biomass to bacteria and they're going to eat it and produce methane, which is also going to be used probably for making more energy. So how much energy are we really getting from algae? Think about it this way. In 2007, we grew about 67 billion acres of soybean in the United States. And as you know, we sort of said before, soybean also makes triglycerides and if we use all of it for making biodiesels, we probably could have replaced a sizable chunk of the onward petroleum diesel use. If most likely about six percent of all on-road petroleum diesel use in the United States, if that were the case. But if we had decided to make algae instead, we're using sixty-seven million acres um, of land in the United States to grow algae farms, we could have replaced a lot more of the on-road petroleum diesel use, uh, over 100% of the on-road petroleum diesel use just from um, algae biodiesel production in 2007. So it's an incredible amount of energy. Out of one hectare of, of an algae farm, we get 180 gigajoules in one year. And if you're not really sure what that means, to sort of put it in a little perspective, uh, about a pound of TNT, uh, when blown up, is going to release about 42 million joules. So if you do the math, uh, you can sort of see we're going to need about 85,714 pounds of TNT and then blow it all up to get the same amount of energy that's coming out of an algae biodiesel's farm in one year. So it seems like algae is really a really promising um, biodiesel, biofuel stock. But there are still a few obstacles to it, and that's one of the reasons why we haven't seen a lot of bio, biofuel energy coming from algae just yet. One of the things is, one of the biggest problems actually is that it's not quite economically viable yet. The place where you do see a little bit more of this, of this stuff coming out is, is going to be Europe, where the price of diesel is a little bit more expensive than it is here in the United States. Over there, it's getting close to maybe 7 or $8 a gallon. But over here, uh, we sort of see gasoline or diesel costing about $4 a gallon. Algae, on the other hand, is going to be a lot more expensive than this. It's going to cost about uh, $7 a gallon for, you know, even for, for just one gallon um, or for just for even the, the cheapest kind of algae that we can make. And there's, um, there's quite a few reasons why this is why why algae is going to be more expensive. One of the problems is that when you grow algae, it's only going to occupy about you know, one or less than 1% of the total volume of water that you're, you're growing it in. Um, and that sort of ends up 
translates a lot of chemical and physical costs when you try to separate the algae from the rest of the water and get the water back out and sort of separate the, the, the oil bodies out um, from all the things that it ends up being mixed in with. And one of the other problems is that if you grow algae in sort of open ponds, which is one of the most efficient ways to do it, is that it, it starts attracting these, these zooplankton. Um, uh, sort of like to eat algae, they're going to eat a lot of it, and of course if we have all the zooplankton eating on algae, we're not going to have any left over for making biofuel. But the other thing is that algae is just not quite as efficient as it could be, and uh, the reason for this, or one of the reasons for this is just that if you want to make um, a lot of oil from algae, you're going to have to introduce a stress factor, and that's going to cause algae to grow a little bit more slowly than it normally does. And this sort of all ends up translating into increased costs for growing for growing algae. So it seems like we have still a little bit of, of, of a while to go and a lot more research to do. And a lot of people are doing this research. Uh, people have found that like adding zebrafish to their algae ponds are going to help the growth because, or, or help sort of the production because these zebrafish are provide a top-down ecological control by eating all the zooplankton and saving the algae from being eaten. Um, and then, right now, we kind of see that like not a lot of strains of algae have been fully sequenced in, for in terms of the genome. So as more more people start sequencing more more strains of algae and sort of finding out what the what the, the entire sequence of the genome is going to be, we're going to have make a lot of more advances in engineering uh, stronger and more efficient types of algae. And hopefully within the next sort of 10 to 15 years we're going to see a lot more algae biofuel.